Ruffian was a miracle of nature. Ruffian was arguably the fastest horse anyone has ever seen. Ruffian was literally a once-in-a-lifetime phenomenon. People are saying that your filly is the best two-year-old in the country. Is that what people are saying? They say she was a freak. A freak in a good way. A freak like you'd describe uh, Michael Jordan. There's something he does that is a little beyond explanation. Holy crap, who the hell is she? That, my friend, is... Ruffian. If you saw a race, you'd never forget her. She was something. She was really something. She was undefeated in 10 starts and broke or equaled the record every time out. When you see her, you, you're stunned. Just physically, she was so fantastic. Probably the greatest filly you ever lived. She won the Philly Triple Crown, the Acorn, the Mother Goose, the Coaching Club American Oaks. She just dominated her competition. She had this mass and power, and at the same time, a delicate, kind of queen-like gestures. She was beautiful, she was smart, she was fast. She was everything that any woman would ever want to be. She looked like she'd been put together by the Greek gods. And not only that, but when the gates opened up, she was gone. And Ruffian, undefeated in five starts last year, jumps right to the front in her comeback. She left the starting gate like a bird leaves a branch. She went right to the front and said, come on and get me. And among all the females that ever ran against her, nobody ever could. The original story takes place in the 70s. At that time, all of the feminist movement was rising, and there was this debate about, you know, men versus women. It was also the time of uh, uh, Billie Jean King and Bobby Riggs. It was the big he versus she. A match race, boy versus girl, ruffian versus foolish pleasure. The two best three-year-olds in the country, a fight to the finish. Now, along comes this phenomenon, and there's tremendous pressure to stage a race between Ruffian and a Colt. Foolish Pleasure had won the Kentucky Derby, but this match race just set it up. We got our backs against the wall. The newspapers won't let go. The truth of the matter is, the sport is hurting. Everybody wanted a piece of Ruffian, from the owners to the trainers to the media. It's like any genius. If you pull him apart from so many directions, at the end, it falls apart. When you have a superstar horse like this, you get surrounded by people who don't really know horses. Ruffian belongs to you, but she also belongs to the public. It's a little frustrating for, for horsemen, you know, who are, who are trying to deal with the with the job of being a trainer, and they're being bothered all the time and drawn away from the job at hand, you know. It's a complicated movie because you can't uh, shoot it in the real location for the whole period, so you're merging Shreveport, Louisiana with Belmont in New York. At Shreveport, there are about 1,200 horses in those stables. So you had everything that you needed for a horse movie. The grandstand in Belmont is so big and so unique that you couldn't duplicate that. So mix that complexity with the weather, plus the thoroughbreds. <laughs> All that put together makes this movie probably the most complicated film I have ever made. Move on. Cut! Can okay. we move the rope? Quick, we're Jackson picking up speed. Through. What we're doing here is we're replicating the crowd, so this way when we open up this shot, we see all these people getting ready for the big match race. So it sets the stage. So it'll be a magnificent shot, establishing both Belmont and the amount of people. We'll show you the composite here with all the people and all the set dressing, such as the little banners. We had 70 extras on this day, and there you have roughly what feels like two or 3,000 people. Now. How we shot this was, we had a walking green screen here for the horse, and then we went back and we shot each of the crowds as pods in perspective 
meaning everything lines up perfectly and is steady to achieve the shot. So again, it's moving around the same 70 people. So when we had them in one quadrant, they would do a performance, then we move them to create enough variations because what you don't want to get is a pattern. You know, having the same lady in a red dress appear all the way through every time you looked at this. The script had that very simple approach of showing the relationship between the trainer and that exceptional animal. And when I heard that Sam Shepard was going to play Frank Whiteley, I mean, that became a must for me. What the hell are you guys doing? What's the matter with you? You represent a bit of that Americana that comes so strongly across, you know, that character. You got your eye on something special? Come on, you. Now quit talking and get these horses fed. Frank Whiteley was a real horseman. He was what they call a hard boot trainer. He believed in oats and fresh water and exercise. She's some kind of race horse. You know, she ain't raced nobody yet. Race or not, I love that horse. You never fall in love with one. There's a wonderful scene when Ruffian's recovering from an early injury, and it's Christmas, and they're all alone in the stable. And uh, Frank gets the notion that Ruffian wants to go out. Tell you what, one little stroll. It's because it's Christmas. And he takes a great risk because he takes her off the lead, at which point most horses will bolt and run, but not Ruffian. He starts doing a little dance with it. As someone with such sound knowledge, he's unshakable in his convictions about what the horse should do and what he doesn't want the horse to do. Without a trainer like Frank, there is no Ruffian. Whiteley was a guy who knew what his horse needed. He knew when it needed it. He knew when his horse was off. He knew everything about it. And, and those are the best kind of trainers, the guys who spend all their time with the horse. The Champagne is a rare opportunity for us to feature Ruffian and Foolish Pleasure in the same field. I need to take care of a horse. Sam, you know, his horses. He grew up taking care of horses and brings a familiarity that Basically, it's impossible to train for in a, in a prep period for a movie. Sam Shepard wanders over, and he sees documentary footage of Ruffian walking in with Frank, and he says, he says, oh, there I am. I, I, that, that looks pretty good. When did we shoot that? And Eve Simino, the director, looked at him, and he went, Sam, this is real footage. That's the real Frank. That's how much Sam Shepard has gotten into this film. He has gradually transformed himself into Frank Whiteley. I'll tell you what, I'll make you a little deal. You stick to the writing part of it, and I'll do the horse training, OK? Fair enough. The press didn't like Frank that much. Frank played tricks on news people who didn't know the business. He had no interest in getting his picture in the newspaper. All he wanted to do was to please his owners, get the most out of his horses, and make a living at it. Give me something, will you? Anything, an inkling. I gotta have something to write about. You know, I thought you guys made all this stuff up. Frank was very guarded and protective. But um, with Bill, he was a little bit more open. And I think he understood that Bill had her best interest and the best interest of the sport in mind. Bill Knack was the best investigative reporter on the scene. He worked for Newsday. And every time he talked, he was writing copy. He's one of our greatest writers. It's one of Frank's cheap crows. He has just finished writing about the legendary horse, Secretariat. He no longer wanted to be a reporter. He felt that he covered the ultimate. And then he met Ruffian. Just on his way out, he met Ruffian, and Ruffian changed his life. The first phone call I made is to the casting director. I said, OK, I need three men, not over 115 pounds, Hispanic, but could speak English. We ended up with one person. 
So the next thing was we're gonna cast out of Mexico, out of Panama, out of anywhere that is a Latino that has a community of horse racing. And we ended up with three wonderful guys. And it gives that authenticity that you need to the movie. Now if you pull that again on me, I'm gonna have to find another rider, you understand? I hear you. You're me. What'd you say? A prayer. Jacinto is doing actually the Jacinto role. He's riding it. He's, he's, there is no stunts in it. And I'm doing Baez's part. It's a blessing that what you see out there is actually the real thing. And they're off. Well, a friend of mine in New Orleans called me one day and said, oh, they're making a movie of Ruffian. And I had my agent get in touch with the uh, proper people, and here I am. It's Ruffian in front by a length and three quarters. I've done uh, several movies and Broadway show and some summer stock, but no, I've never played myself. A sensational return to the racing wars, Ruffian by almost five lengths. I actually had the audio tapes of all of her races, and I'd save them because they meant so much to me. It's Ruffian, and she's back. To recreate the races were very easily done. That equals the track record for Belmont Park's five and a half furlong by a Philly Oracle. What a performance. First time starter Ruffian to the winner's circle. Shooting with horses is a very difficult thing, especially thoroughbreds, because they're designed to run and they're so precise in what they're doing and how they have to be treated that when you bring them in the movie world where everything is completely unreal for them, it becomes a, a real challenge. It's a clash. The first thing we had to do is find an expert on horses, and Rusty joined us. And the first thing he said is, I have to travel all over the United States and I have to find several horses that would play as Raffian. Three, two, we have four horses that we've selected to play the part of Ruffian, uh, knowing we'd need multiples. You start with a physical description, Ruffian being a, a rather large, very black-looking filly. To get her as dark as possible, we augmented with some dye. When I saw them, they were brown and they were, they were long hair and they, they were not prepared for the, for the film yet. And once they started to give them the right color and it became really, really interesting to see how close we were able to match one to another. But it's not only about the look, it's about the, the character of the horse, the personality. We're also using gildings because if we have one filly and they don't take the filmmaking process quite as good. That's kind of a, a, an interesting problem that I think Rusty solved very well because he's got a big elegant gelding that looks actually female, you know. And then you got another rougher one uh, called Monkey. He's a little coarser, but when you see him in the context of the film, you, you wouldn't be able to distinguish him. And I think that's what Rusty does so well, is making four horses into one. The horses that are coming out of a racing situation, they have a limited tolerance for time and exposure to the track. The racetrack never leaves them. Some horses have a high capacity. They can take, you know, tons of that stuff, and, and some can't tolerate none of it. Just like if we did this for three hours right here, he'd get restless. He needs to go, need to go do something. We'd go spend a little time with him, and he'd come back, and he'd settle. Horses have a limitation on how much they can run. And uh, you have a limitation on how many days you can shoot. They all break pretty close to even. Right. And how to create a puzzle that actually works for the movie and for the horses is where Rusty's expertise uh, brings not only beauty but also order. In the world of horse racing, after horses run a race, Usually there's several days of recuperation. With the filming process, the horse is never pushed past a distance in which he's depleting himself. So they can usually work up to a quarter of a mile, rest, and do that again. Up to four times in a day. 
and then we usually give them a couple of days off in between these things. You have to worry about their energy level for them. They won't, they won't worry for themselves. They don't even know when they hurt. It's amazing. Keep her under wraps. We're on a slow three eighths, all right? All right. Don't push her. Okay. See where the jockey is? We could do the same sequence um, for numerous takes. We can't continually have the same horses run every single take. Like this, like this, like this, release them, boom. In the finished product, it's gonna look like the horses were running around the entire track in one segment, but they were not. The ruffian's races are harder to tell because she was so dominating in her performance. How do you make this exciting and sell the essence of speed when she's just so clearly way ahead of everybody else. Yeah, yeah. Shh, 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 shh. No. I don't know, Doc. She's going to tear that whole foot up. You don't give up easy, do you, girl? Now, my name is Bob Vasquez. I'm the special effects supervisor on the movie Ruffian. This is a rig that was built by uh, Bruce and Pat, and it's actually used when Ruffian gets a little bit obstinate inside uh, a stall. It's a little bit more, girl. Oh, come on now. And it's a kick. Let's make a kick, and if you see it, it's articulated so that we can adjust the hit as hard as we want it, or as light as we want it. OK, you're all right. What happens is that Bruce studies the movement of the horse's leg. And then he mechanically constructs through gears and wheels and wire the articulated movement of the horse, which takes a lot of time because you have to watch horses kick, horses move. We put the spring in to really work like a, a real horse's tendon. So that when he kicks, we get this extension so that it actually functions like a real horse. OK, we'll go with the soft one. Adjustments have to be made for distance, for reach. And when Bruce operates it, it'll look just like Ruffian's leg, and it'll make its kick. It's taken us about eight weeks, really, to from start to finish to get them done. The challenge here with this particular visual effects shot was we needed to show Ruffian breaking down. Breaking down means the horse actually broke a limb. We shot a real horse running through frame. We used a special high-speed camera. We have the real horse that, that ran through flawlessly. No pain to the animal, nothing happened. Now, this leg here is a 3D replacement. 3D means it's an element that we created here in post and put it back in. Now, what we did to make it so it matches is we took the real leg and we used it as a texture itself and put it back over on top of the 3D leg. And then we animated it to make this break. The audience could see the snap, which is horrific, and then, and then we get out of it and we go into a couple other visual effects shots. From here, the element goes up to the compositors, which are known as 2D compositors. They're the ones who put together all the elements to make the image come to life. The difference between Ruffian, the champion, and any other thoroughbreds is one or two seconds. So for an untrained eye, they all run fast. But you have that little margin that makes a horse like Ruffian exceptional. So when a man like Whiteley finds a horse that can deliver that repeatedly, he's in awe. And he knows at the same time that that very powerful animal is extremely fragile. That it takes nothing, next to nothing, to destroy it. And that's what we see in the movie. It's an inspirational story of love, of feeling between animal and man. Sam Shepard loves horses. He owns horses. He races horses. And he brought a special kind of spark to those scenes as written where you feel the connection. What the film can show is that Frank Whiteley is a man of, of total integrity. And those are the best kind of trainers, the guys who spend all their time with the horse. Ruffian and Frank Whiteley are the stars of the film. 
uh, in this case, Ruffian and, and Sam Shepard. And the way the film portrays Frank is that he's like the last man standing between her and the rest of the world, and he's gonna protect her. But there's only so much protection he can give her because she's owned by somebody else who wants to do with the horse what Frank himself really doesn't want to do. This tough guy who's all about horses sees the most extraordinary horse die in, almost in his hands. So you go from somebody who doesn't show any emotions to somebody who's gonna live the biggest one, which is the loss of you know, something that you really, really love and that you have involved in all your life in, in many ways. When the greats are no longer around, our imagination gives flight to their being. And that is what has happened with Ruffian. Her memory has now taken on wings, the wings that she herself had as a racehorse. She's like James Dean or, you know, Marilyn Monroe or Lady Di. Not only did she win every race that she, she was involved with and broke a lot of records, but there was an aura about her that hasn't been equaled since. What people may not understand is how much courage there is in a racehorse. What Ruffian did at the end, and this is so touching to me, um, to keep running is one of those things that it's like people who get injured in any kind of sport. People keep going and you think that that's a human trait, but it's something about the courage of a being to keep at it beyond the pain of the injury to keep trying. They are amazing creatures, and it's the most wonderful, wonderful movie for showing that to people.